Rejects and Revolutionaries, formerly the American History Podcast, tells the story of the people who became Americans. The long-term goal is to answer the question of who we are as a people, and to quote Tom Lehrer, how we got that way, but the process of achieving it involves a meandering journey through 17th century England, Scotland, and the Americas, and events ranging from the famous to the utterly forgotten. So join me, Sarah Tungsalvala, as we discuss hopes, ideals, fears, and failures in the future USA. Hello everyone, and welcome back to the History of Africa podcast. I'm your host, Andy. Last episode, the Third Anglo-Ashanti War came to a disastrous conclusion. The Ashanti army suffered a crushing defeat at the Battle of Amofo, allowing the British army to ransack and destroy much of Kumasi. The British looted innumerable valuable resources, set multiple buildings on fire, and demolished the royal palace with dynamite. The longtime capital of Ashantiman, once among the most impressive metropolitan cities in the world, was now left a smoldering pile of ash and rubble. This episode, the Ashanti will struggle to come to terms with this disaster. How could they rebuild from such a devastating calamity? And, perhaps more importantly, who could be blamed? Season 3, Episode 25, The Joaben War July of 1874 was a miserable time in the Ashanti capital. Komasi, once one of the most impressive cities in West Africa and the world, was a pile of ash after the devastating British sack of the city. All of the city's most important buildings, including its royal palace, mausoleum, public bath, and stone fortress, were all either burnt, demolished, or otherwise looted to the point of being an empty husk. To make matters worse, the wet season was out in full force, so the pelting rainstorms made any attempt at reconstruction impossible for the time being. Not to mention, the Ashanti state was entirely bankrupt. The government had already faced severe budgetary issues even before their war with the British, and the expenses of the war only made things worse. And of course, the war had concluded with Cockery agreeing to pay the British 50,000 ounces, or approximately 1.5 metric tons of gold, as an indemnity. Paying this indemnity was the first and most important item on Cockery's agenda. If he didn't pay up, it would likely promote another British invasion, which the Ashanti would be completely unprepared to resist. In addition, providing the gold indemnity in a timely and hasty manner, if he could get the indemnity paid fast, Cockery hoped that the British would then actively support his position and ensure that he remained in power. So, the Ashantahene summoned the Ashante Manchiamu and requested their assistance in paying the indemnity. It would be tough, but if he and all the other members of parliament all worked together, they could manage to come up with enough funds. Needless to say, the reaction he got was hostile. Demanding for the governors and bureaucrats of the parliament to pay him gold even during a normal time would be a tall order. For a king as insecure in his power as Kofi Kakari, it was an impossibility. Kakari's request for gold was widely mocked, and he was laughed out of the room. After all, to the members of the Ashanti Manchiamu, it was Kakari, not them, who had signed the peace with Wolseley. So why was he expecting the legislature to draw from their own personal fortunes to help him pay for the indemnity he owed? Beyond that, Kakari was kind of being a bit of a hypocrite. We didn't really have a chance to bring it up in any of our episodes, but remember how Kakari had been a pretty quiet, mild-mannered member of the Ashanti nobility before his rise to power? Well, spending some time as the most prestigious and beloved figure in the entire Ashanti Empire had reversed that. Particularly, Cockery had a bit of a reputation for abusing his office for his own lustful pursuits. When it came to leisure time, Cockery's favorite activity was to hit on just about any woman he met. Old, young, married, single, it didn't matter as long as Cockery had an eye for her. And when it came to flirting, Cockery wasn't just buying drinks from across the bar, he was going all out. He would lavish female strangers with shockingly large gifts, including bags of gold, cowries, and precious stones, just to get their attention. Not to mention, if this woman happened to be married, as she often was, he also paid out lavish bribes to her husband in exchange for permission to take her as his own. This behavior earned Cockery one of his most enduring nicknames, a chempo or he who gives away gold. The expenses for Cockery's flirtation, and the relationships that sometimes developed after, 
really added up over time. Now, polygamy wasn't super unusual for the Ashanti upper classes, and it wouldn't be seen as weird for a wealthy or powerful man to have maybe three or five wives, and maybe for an Ashanti handy to have somewhere between 10 and 20. Kakari, he married more than 500 women. When you consider that he had only been king for seven years, a quick bit of math shows you that he was marrying a new woman about every five days. So, when he who gives away gold started talking about how we all need to just work together and tighten up our budgets a bit to pay off this foreign debt, the irony wasn't lost on anyone. Here's an idea, jerk. How about you stop handing out gold to every woman you get the hots for, and maybe you could pay the indemnity yourself? But, well, there was hypocrisy to go around here, and members of the Ashanti Manchiamu also exhibited plenty. Remember, the majority of the members of parliament had firmly supported Aman Kwasha and the pro-war faction just a couple years ago. Many of these guys were singers in the chorus of voices that insisted war with the British was a great idea. It would be an easy and profitable victory. Don't even worry about it. Cockery himself was happy to point out their hypocritical objections. Uh, this war that we lost was, at least partially, your idea. You had no problem handing over money to the government to pay for your stupid war. Now that we've lost, though, you can't accept having to help pay for the indemnity? Honestly, both sides make a pretty good point, and nobody comes out of this debate looking good. So, Kakari and the Ashanti Manchiamu will mutually recognize their failings and find a productive, beneficial solution for everyone, right? Heh, <laughs> this is politics we're talking about. No, they both dug in their heels and waited for the other to blink first. Ultimately, it was Kakari who gave in. Seeing that the many Omanhenes and Ansafohenes weren't gonna budge, he resolved that he would pay the indemnity on his own. He couldn't universally level taxes anymore, or really enforce laws generally. His allies in the military had either abandoned him when they sided with the pro-peace faction, like Adu Bofor, or died, like Aman Kwasha. So, any time that Kakari leveled a proclamation, people could just respond, you and what army? So, he can't raise taxes, and he can't pay for the indemnity with the royal treasury. The only means remaining for him to make new revenue was something so dishonorable that it's almost impossible to picture Nishantahene doing it. Grave robbing. The traditional Akan religion of Akom has always been primarily centered around worship of the ancestors. In Akom theology, Nyame was the all-powerful and one true god, while his children, the Abosom, acted as his intermediaries on earth. While people would sometimes pray to the Abosom for guidance or health, it was the Nanamom and Sampo, or spirits of the ancestors, who received the lion's share of everyday worship. Whether it was more mundane everyday problems or great personal trials alike, the ancestors were the recipient of the majority of religious veneration. We've seen this motif emerge several times on this show. The importance of the symbol of the stool in Ashanti culture originates from the Akom belief that stools house part of the ancestors' souls after they die. Back in the episode on Ose Bonso, the main theme of the epic poem, The Ape of Osebonso, is how even a great man must not let his own pride subsume his veneration of the ancestors. The Ashanti law code stipulated that insulting someone's ancestors was criminal. Needless to say, veneration and worship of the ancestors was a big deal. This made it all the more shocking when, one night, the Ashantahene Kofi Kakari was caught grave robbing from the royal ancestors buried in the ruins of the Komasi Mausoleum. For his crime, Kakri was arrested and soon after put on trial. The king of Ashantiman was about to be impeached. In October of 1874, the trial to impeach Ashantahene Kofi Kakri assembled in Komasi. Among the onlookers were all of the major names during Kakri's reign. His rivals like Owosu Koko, his former allies in Kwanta and Arubo IV, even his own mother Afwa Kobi. After committing the great sin of defiling the graves of his ancestors, Everyone had turned on him, even his mother. Kobe figured that trying to defend her son after such a scandalous act was a lost cause. If her lineage was to remain in power, it would have to be through somebody else. Not to mention, she did still have some lingering resentment over her son's failure to heed her warnings about war with the British. So, she cut all ties with her disgraced eldest son, practically disowning him. By the end of the meeting, the decision was close to unanimous. Kofi Kakri was relieved of his duty as a Shantahene. He, a few dozen of his wives, and 500 of his close friends, attendees, and allies were banished from Kumasi. They marched in a melancholic procession into a small village in the countryside, 
where they were supposed to begin a quiet, humble life away from mainline Ashanti politics. Keep this in the back of your mind, because, as we'll see in the future, Cockery will not go away so easily. But, at least for now, Cockery was out of everyone's hair, and his seven-year-long reign was officially over. So, the new question, of course, was who would rule next? This question was further complicated by the fact that, technically, Kofi Cockery hadn't exactly been the permanent Ashantahene to begin with. Remember, since the very beginning of his rise, Cockery had claimed to essentially be a placeholder. The young Kwako Joa II, the paternal grandson of the old Ashantahene Kwako Joa, had always been, officially, the heir to the Golden Stool. The problem had been that he was, well, a small boy in 1867. Seven years later, and Kwako Joa II, while still a child, was 13. Now, this was still too young to take power according to typical Ashanti customs. The youngest Ashantahene in history had been Opokuware, instilled sometime between the ages of 15 and 18, which is itself an outlier in Ashanti history. During normal times, the idea of letting a 13-year-old become instilled as Ashantahene was absolutely unthinkable. A regent would have to be appointed to hold power until the young Kwako Joa II was, well, less young and actually ready to rule. The default choice for this position was Afwakobi's second oldest son, but he had died a long time ago, so instead the position defaulted to her third eldest son, the 34-year-old Mensa Bonso. Mensa Bonso, like his older brother, had been someone who maintained a pretty quiet reputation before being suddenly foisted onto the national spotlight. He had been present in many government meetings, but had never really spoken up or done anything noteworthy enough to create a large array of enemies or friends in the state. So, during normal times, he would have made for an unimpressive, but equally unoffensive pick to take the golden stool. But remember, these weren't normal times. Many of the powerful people in the Ashanti Empire were already absolutely fed up with Afwa Kobe and her sons. The most notable of these opponents was Joaben Hene Asafo Aji. You see, Aji didn't come to power in Joaben through typical means. He wasn't even a direct part of the traditional Joaben monarchy, but had been appointed by the old Ashantahene Kwako Joa I when the city became enraptured in a succession dispute between two lines of the old Joaben dynasty. So Aji had been, from the beginning, a hardcore Kwako Joa loyalist, and as a result, had supported Owosukoko during his dispute with Kakari and Afwa Kobe several years earlier. And, of course, he was also the King of Joaben. Joaben, as you might have noticed this season, had quite the long historical rivalry with the Greater Ashanti government. The city had long been the second city of the Ashanti Empire, exceeded only by Kumasi in its scale, importance, and economic power. In the 19th century in particular, Joaben had grown considerably as a hub of the ascendant Sahelian kola nut trade. In the years past, while the kings of Joaben had sometimes challenged the authority of the Ashantahene, it had never been enough to truly surpass the political and economic prestige of the capital. Well, that had been true until Wolseley and the British burnt most of Kumasi to the ground, while Joaben had successfully defended itself and remained untouched. Now, Joaben was firmly recognized as the most important, prestigious, and wealthiest Ashanti city. The other key rival faced by Kobe was much more shocking. This was the mother of Kwako Joa II and Kobe's own daughter, a woman by the name of Ya Achia. Yeah, it's a pretty big detail, and I feel kind of dumb for forgetting to bring it up last episode. It was actually in an earlier draft, and I think I cut it by accident and just sort of forgot to put it back in. In addition to her many sons, Afwa Kobe had many daughters. One of these daughters, Ya Achia, ended up marrying one of Kwako Joa the first sons, and gave birth to Kwako Joa the second alongside a whopping 12 other children. So, yeah, Kwako Joa the second is not some random kid to Afwa Kobe, as I might have accidentally implied last episode. He was her grandson, and the nephew of Kakari and Mensa Bonso. This is part of the reason for why he was selected as the eventual heir to the Golden Stool, because he was uniquely a part of the lineage of the Queen Mother Afwa Kobe, as well as the lineage of Kwako Joa I. Anyways, Ya Acha had a fairly long history of advocating on her son's behalf. She had been one of the main architects for a push to place the boy on the throne immediately in 1867, which earned the great ire of her mother. In 1874, she continued to do the same thing lobbying to Major Omanhenes and generals to support her bid to have her son immediately elevated to the Golden Stool. Afwa Kobe and Mensa Bonso were not without allies of their own. 
While the war and its failure had truly tanked the reputation of Kakari, remember that Kobe had, since the very beginning, been part of the faction that had aptly predicted the war's failures and urged restraint. The war's eventual failure had vindicated Kobe. Not to mention, her opponents still had to make the very hard case that a 13-year-old boy was fit to rule the Empire. Saying you dislike Kobe and her sons was one thing, but arguing that a 13-year-old would make a better replacement was a much harder case to make. Many of the veteran generals from the Sagrenti War, including the elderly General Lanquanta and the now more established and equally vindicated General Adubo IV, also placed their support behind the royal family. What sealed Mensabonso's victory in the election, however, was something different entirely. While the Ashanti Manchiamu debated over who should rule the empire, further south, in the territory of Adansi, the local elites there were having a debate of their own. Adansi, the province located to the near southwest of Ashantiman, was among the first external territories integrated into the Ashanti Empire, acquired during Osei Tutu's war against Denshira way back at the start of this season. The region was pretty small, both in terms of population and area, but carried an outsized importance in Ashanti economic and political life. This was because the region was home to the Obuasi Goldfields, by far the most lucrative area of the empire for gold prospecting. As a result, the region had long suffered under heavy Ashanti taxation and overt exploitation, but the tiny population was helpless against the overwhelming power of Kumasi. The Ashanti defeat in the Sagrenti War, though, showed the Adansi that this overwhelming power was perhaps not so overwhelming after all. When the British colonial government approached the Adansi Hene and offered him protectorate status against the Ashanti, he accepted. The Adansi, as well as the lucrative goldfields they operated, were now outside of Ashanti control. The Adansi's secession led to a panic in Kumasi. If something wasn't done to restabilize the situation quickly, the entire Ashanti empire could fall apart one piece at a time. There was no way that they could entrust a child to rule the empire during an era as dangerous as this one. With the returning news of the Adansi secession, the Ashanti Manchiamu overwhelmingly elected Mensa Bonso as the next Ashanti Hene. Even Yaacha herself conceded that her son should probably wait. However, there was one man who was very upset with this decision, the Joabin Hene. You see, Aji had really hedged his bets on a weak, childish Ashanti Hene taking over. Not only would this grant him greater autonomy, but he also feared reprisal for his shenanigans during the Third Anglo-Ashanti War, namely refusing to join the Ashanti army during the Battle of Amafu. So, he changed his tune. Joabin was a stronger, richer, and more prestigious city than Komasi at this point anyways, right? Besides, this whole Ashanti Empire thing is clearly a sinking ship. So, he did something unprecedented, and declared independence. The secession of Juaben from the Ashanti Empire was enormous. This was the first time in Ashanti history that one of the kings of the four cultical cities declared his independence from the Ashanti Empire. The kings of Juaben had certainly bickered and fought with the Ashanti Hene before, but had never come even close to this. Mensa Bonso could not let this happen. If Juaben was allowed to secede unchallenged, anyone could secede unchallenged. It would set a precedent that would certainly mean the end of Ashanti unity. And Aji definitely went too far. While he was correct to calculate that Ashantiman was weak and divided, and that, yes, it was a sinking ship, it was not yet below water. In fact, Aji's declaration, if anything, served to unite the other Ashantis against Juaben. In January of 1875, the Ashanti Manjamu convened once again, in an entirely different mood from before. Rather than bickering, there was vengeful unity. Each Omanhene present enthusiastically proclaimed their readiness to fight on Mensa Bonso's behalf, and to crush the rebellious Aji. Within a few months, Mensa Bonso had raised a respectable army of 15,000 men, compared to the Juaben force of around 10,000. We'll be back after a quick break. I'm Robin Dreek, trust expert, FBI spy recruiter, and veteran Marine. Tune into my Forge by Trust podcast and learn to recognize behavioral skills for forging trust in others and yourself for maximum success in all aspects of your life. This podcast is for people who value building strong, healthy relationships upon a foundation of trust. You will learn interpersonal communication strategies and how to interpret the behavior of others in order to create the healthy culture you need to excel. 
tune into the Forge by Trust podcast on your favorite podcast streaming platform. More importantly, these men were well equipped. Despite the tumult of the war, one positive result of the Ashanti fight with the British was the introduction of new rifle models from captured British soldiers. It hadn't paid off at the time, as Ashantimon lacked the manufacturing power to pump out these new weapons to equip their army, and supply shortages were so endemic throughout the conflict anyways, but now that the war was over, the Ashanti finally had a chance to start equipping their soldiers with simulacrum copies of the .557 Snyder Enfields that the British had used. Meanwhile, the army that Aji was raising in Joaben was still primarily using guns based off the Dutch models imported all the way back in the 1840s. Mensobonso's new army was divided in two and placed under the command of the two most famous generals in the empire, Ajo Bofor and Asamoah Nkwanta. The coming battle would not be easy. Not only did they have to defeat Joaben's army, they would have to do it fast. Bonzo worried that if this war took too long, Aji would establish an agreement with the British and attract them as allies. According to records from the colonial office at the time, he was right to fear. The governor of the Gold Coast, carefully watching what was going on, loudly and publicly announced that he was willing to supply arms and food to Juaben in an effort to weaken the Ashanti Empire. He couldn't put this plan into action yet, as he had to convince the other bureaucrats in the colonial government to support such a provocation, and Mensa Bonso knew that it was now or never. He had to strike before the deal between Joaben and the British could be finalized. In October of 1875, he gave the order to his generals to advance on the city of Joaben. The ensuing Battle of Joaben was fierce and bloody. After a few hours of probing skirmishes, the Joaben army managed to lure Nkwanta's army into a trap. From here, the description of the battle from the stool histories begins to paint a picture reminiscent of a Hollywood action film. Outmaneuvered by his foes, the silver-haired general and Quanta and his army were encircled by Joaben. With his force isolated and split off from the rest of the Imperial Army, the Joaben force pushed in, massacring in Quanta's army as they went. The general himself, figuring that he'd rather go out in a blaze of glory than by a Joaben bullet, decided to make his final stand at his ammo reserves. And Quanta and a few loyal lieutenants, after fighting as long as they could, decided to light their barrels of ammunition ablaze, killing themselves in an impressive explosion. While the scene is certainly impressive, the result doesn't change much. With half of the Ashanti force destroyed, many within Beaufort's remaining army were ready to concede their own defeat. At one meeting, the officers in his army tried to convince Beaufort to give up the fight entirely and retreat back to Ashantiman. Beaufort, in true action movie protagonist style, stood up on a barrel of ammunition and announced that he would refuse to move from his spot no matter what. He left the army with a binary choice. They could either abandon him to his death like cowards, or fight with him like men. Despite the desperate circumstances, the speech worked, and the Ashanti forces rallied. In the coming battle, Beaufort and his army bested their Joaben foes and captured the city. Aji and the Joaben army were forced to retreat, followed closely by the pursuing Beaufort, south into Acheman. Civilian residents of Joaben also fled, knowing that their homes were about to experience a cataclysm. The largest of these groups, a population of about 15,000 refugees, settled in the city of Chevi. There they were greeted not only by the local Achim peoples, but by a small population of the descendants of Joaben refugees from an earlier conflict with Komasi. You might remember these people from our episodes on Oseya Koto and Kwakojoa. These refugees had chose to remain in Achiman even after Kwakojoa I invited them to return. I'm willing to bet that underneath the empathy for their defeated countrymen, they also felt a weak twinge of smug vindication. I told you it was a bad idea to go back. As its inhabitants poured out of Joaben, Mensa Bonso put the city to the torch. Every major building of any cultural significance to the locals was either burned, demolished with gunpowder, or otherwise disassembled. It must have seemed like the Imperial Army was mirroring what the British had done to Komasi, taking out their frustration from the destruction of their home on the King of Joaben, who, in their view, had let it happen. The rivalry between Joaben and Komasi would be no more. It was an Ashanti victory for the ages. Or was it? In some ways, the Joaben War of 1875 truly was an impressive victory for Menza Bonso and the Ashanti Empire. Had Aji succeeded in his efforts to establish an independent Joaben, that likely would have been the end of the Ashanti Empire right there. Joaben was simply too important to let go. Not only was the city enormously significant in terms of population and economy, the symbolic importance of the city alone was enough to fight. Joaben, alongside Mampong, Bekwai, and of course Komasi, 
were the four original cities of the Ashanti state. They were the kings who had sided with Osetutu against the Danshira. As long as the Ashanti Empire had existed, these four cities had always been a part of it. The idea of the Komasi government as a union of all Ashantis hinged on the empire ruling over, well, all Ashantis. Letting Dwaben just up and leave was beyond the pale. Mensa Bonso had to show that this was no confederation. Membership was not voluntary. Financial concerns played a role too, with the Ashanti economy being in the tatters that it was, Losing access to one of the last valuable trade routes that the Ashanti truly dominated, the Kola Road, would mean a complete collapse of the Ashanti economy. But did this war really bring the Ashanti any closer back to recovering their pre-1873 power? Honestly, no. By the time the Ashanti armies returned from their grand victories, the city that they had recaptured was not a city at all, but a collection of huddled survivors living in the shadows of scorched ruins. So. In reality, Mensa Bonso had done nothing to bring the Ashanti back to their glory days. And in reality, he had only briefly stopped the bleeding. And this might be easy to forget given the way that they were treated like a foreign enemy, but the people of Juaben were Ashanti. The very notion that Mensa Bonso was willing to act with such destructive cruelty towards members of his own country, even rebellious ones, shows a deadly breakdown in Ashanti cultural solidarity. It will certainly not be the last time that Mensa Bonsa would act in such a way, and sadly, this would become the norm for the remainder of Ashanti history. So, yes, the Ashanti Empire survived. It was still around. But when they were willing to do this to other Ashantis, is it really fair to say that there was still a united Ashanti nation? And, spoiler alert, if you look at the world map today and try to look for the Ashanti Empire, you'll probably figure out where this is going. Yes, we're very quickly approaching the end of Ashanti imperial history. And while it will be sad to witness the eventual demise of this amazing historical empire, society, and civilization, every end is a new beginning. So, at the end of this season, because we met our patron goal, I'm going to release a super special extra long episode on a topic that the patrons chose in a poll a couple months ago. This long episode, or I guess you could call it a mini-season, is going to focus on the so-called Fulani Jihads, a series of Islamic revolutions that transformed basically everything about Islamic West Africa during the late 18th and early 19th centuries. After that, we'll have an entire new season to think about. So, when I first made this program, I really wanted to make sure that the show reflected the histories of all different corners of the African continent. This is the History of Africa podcast, after all. All of Africa. No prepositions or exclusions in mind. So, the way that this system works is that each season will focus on a region or civilization from a different quarter of Africa. We already had a season that took place in the north, a season in the east, this one in the west, so next season will take place in either southern or central Africa. And as always, it is not my decision to make where we go. The patrons will get to vote on where exactly the next season will focus. So, by the time this episode is up, there will be a live poll on patreon.com slash historyofafrica that anyone can vote in if they pledge any amount above $1 to the Patreon. If you want to participate in deciding where the podcast will turn its focus to next, then I highly suggest you join us on Patreon. Plus, there's all sorts of cool premium episodes to choose from there. I think we have about 30 at this point, meaning we basically have an entire whole season of content. So, if either of those sound like your thing, Help us figure out where we're going next and check out the Patreon. Anyways, now that that's over, let's actually end the episode. Despite starting with what we can reluctantly call a glorious victory, Mensa Bonso's rule will not continue down this path of success. He will have numerous, but entirely unusual problems to deal with. Join us next episode, as Mensa Bonso struggles to deal with the machinations of such diverse enemies as enlightened liberal reformers, and even a cult of ultra-reactionary witch hunters. While we consider if we finally found an Ashantahene who can snag from Oseya Koto the title of Worst King Ever. Thank you for listening to the History of Africa podcast. If you like the show and the free education we provide, then we would love it if you could support the show. You can do this through supporting us monetarily at patreon.com slash historyofafrica, providing the show with a rating or a view on whichever platform you listen on, or sharing the show with anyone who you think might be interested in learning more about African history. This episode is brought to you by our supporters on Patreon, including Naomi Kanakia, Ayo Fagbamie, Morgan Blackmore, Sarah Penza, Tobias Tungland, Dimitri, Emmanuel Zaudi, Alexander Travis, B.B. Milliam, Conrad Schwenke, Travis Bell, Johnny Knowles, Ose Kwame, 
Lucia Plesha, Godfrey Sebalavie, Diz R.H., Evan Edwards, and Pascal Umwakocha, among others. Thank you all for supporting the show. It really means.